The Structure of Scientific Revolutions by Thomas Kuhn, 3rd edition. We are looking at chapter 1 now. Chapter 1 is titled, Introduction, A Role for History. Let me see if I can give you a one-sentence summary of what he's saying in this chapter, and then we'll move toward the text. The history of science should not be given as a list of bullet points about the discoveries of science. We need a history of science that takes more seriously the history of science. Let me, let, me, let me try to rephrase. Let me illustrate that. Some people think of the history of science as the process by which we got to the current state of a good scientific textbook, a nice, up-to-date, thorough scientific textbook. So uh, a scientific textbook includes a large number of theories and methods and lists of experiments. And according to this perspective on the history of science that we're, we're dealing with here, a good history of science is a description of how each little detail in the textbook was, well, written, discovered, theorized, and so on, or each experiment was done. Uh, it's assuming that the current textbook is the correct thing and that uh, scientists over the history of science built it up piece by piece. That's one way of thinking about the history of science, and Kuhn is telling us it's wrong. We need a better history of science, one that takes more seriously the historical events, the historical uh, perspective, uh, and the structure, structure, keyword, the structure of events in the history of science. It's not at all the case that the current scientific textbook and all its details was constructed piece by piece over the history of science, and that's how science works. Science works in a different way. More on that shortly, but first let's get to Kuhn giving this critique. If science is the constellation of facts, theories, and methods collected in current texts, then scientists are the men who, successfully or not, have striven to contribute one or another element to that particular constellation. We are in the third paragraph of chapter one here. If science is just the set of things collected in a current textbook, then scientists are the people who added those things to our knowledge one thing at a time. Scientific development becomes the piecemeal process by which these items have been added singly and in combination to the ever-growing stockpile that constitutes scientific technique and knowledge. And history of science becomes the discipline that chronicles both these successive increments and the obstacles that have inhibited their accumulation. And history of science becomes the history of getting rid of a few obstacles that got in the way of this accumulation of knowledge and adding one piece of knowledge at a time. I never have understood exactly what is that uh, that sound. Some some pipe uh, from time to time, some vent or something makes uh, makes that sound uh, up in the ceiling. Concerned with scientific development, the historian then appears to have two main tasks. On the one hand, he must determine by what man and at what point in time each contemporary scientific fact, law, and theory was discovered or invented. On the other, he must describe and explain the conjuries of error, myth, and superstition that have inhibited the more rapid accumulation of the constituents of the modern science text. Much research has been directed to these ends, and some still is. So, using the flawed understanding of the history of science, and indeed of how science works, we'll get more to how science works, but he's emphasizing the wrong way to think about the history of science at this point. Using the wrong way to think about the history of science. Science is just, um, well, the result of science is just um, this collection of knowledge in the, the science textbook that's up to date, and the history of science, as chronicled by the historian of science, is to be, one, a set of stories about how each of these discoveries was made, each of these facts was, was articulated, etc., and two, a description of what sort of myths, errors, and superstitions got in the way. And that's pretty much it. Now, this is all the wrong way to think about science. Kuhn continues, in recent years, however, a few historians of science have been finding it more and more difficult to fulfill the functions that the concept of development by accumulation assigns to them. As chroniclers of an incremental process, they discover that additional research makes it harder, not easier, to answer questions like, when was oxygen discovered? Who first conceived of energy conservation? Increasingly, a few of them suspect that these are simply the wrong sorts of questions to ask. Perhaps science does not develop by the accumulation of individual discoveries and inventions. Simultaneously, these same historians confront growing difficulties in distinguishing the scientific component of past observation and belief from what their predecessors had readily labeled error and superstition. The more carefully they study, say, Aristotelian dynamics, phlogistic chemistry, or caloric thermodynamics, 
The more certain they feel that these once current views of nature were as a whole neither less scientific nor more the product of human idiosyncrasy than those current today. Uh, the more a careful historian of science studies historical scientific errors, the kind that are thought to be necessarily the result of myth, superstition, or, or some other imperfection in thinking scientifically, the more a historian of science studies these actual historic scientific errors, or things we write off as errors now, the more a careful historian realizes these things are neither less scientific nor more the product of human idiosyncrasy than current scientific theory. If these out-of-date beliefs are to be called myths, then myths can be produced by the same sort of methods and held for the same sort of reasons that now lead to scientific knowledge. These uh, now outdated theories were produced by the same sort of scientific reasoning and the same sort of scientific methods we're using now to get better theories. If, on the other hand, they are to be called science, then science has included bodies of belief quite incompatible with the ones we hold today. So uh, he's setting up a constructive dilemma argument form. A constructive dilemma uh, has this structure. Either A or B, if A then C, if B then D. So either C or D. Okay, so let's uh, see if we can figure out what A, B, C, and D are. Uh, either these out-of-date beliefs are to be called myths or they are to be called science, like um, Aristotelian dynamics, phlogistic chemistry, caloric thermodynamics. If these outdated beliefs are to be called myths, well, let me let me interrupt myself and not finish that sentence. That would have been an unhelpful sentence. Um, structure of the argument: either A or B. If B, then C. If C, then D. Therefore, either C or D. Either these outdated scientific theories are to be called myths, or they are to be called science. If they are to be called myths, then turns out, based on a proper study of history, the same sort of Methods and reasons used by science used by scientists now for our current scientific theories supported myths in the old days. But if these things are to be called science, then it turns out a lot of theories completely incompatible with our theories now have been produced by science. So either scientific ways of thinking lead to myths or <laughs> Some scientific theories are entirely incompatible with the scientific theories we have now. That's the conclusion. Either one of those two things must be the case. Given these alternatives, the historian must choose the latter. So um, of those two things, we have to choose the other one. We have to conclude that some, some scientific theories, accepted for scientific reasons, have been entirely incompatible with the dominant scientific theories now. Out-of-date theories are not in principle unscientific because they've been discarded. Now that choice, however, makes it difficult to see scientific development as a process of accretion. So you cannot think of science, uh, of the history of science, as just accumulating one more detail for the uh, ultimately to be completed scientific textbook. The same historical research that displays the difficulties in isolating individual inventions and discoveries gives ground for profound doubts about the cumulative process through which these individual contributions to science were thought to have been compounded. Science is not. The progress of science over time is not simply a cumulative process. Sometimes it involves something else. Something else. What else? Eventually, we we'll get to him explaining what else does it involve? Scientific revolutions, of course. Let's go down a few paragraphs. Let's skip the first sentence of this paragraph. We're still near enough. I think we can count them. One, two, three, four, five, six. We're in the second sentence of the eighth paragraph of the introduction chapter. Normal science, the activity in which most scientists inevitably spend almost all their time, is predicated on the assumption that the scientific community knows what the world is like. Much of the success of the enterprise derives from the community's willingness to defend that assumption of necessary and considerable cost. Normal science, for example, often suppresses fundamental novelties because they are necessarily subversive of its basic commitments. Nevertheless, so long as those commitments retain an element of the arbitrary, the very nature of normal research ensures that novelty shall not be suppressed for very long. Sometimes a normal problem 
one that ought to be solvable by known rules and procedures, resists the reiterated onslaught of the ablest members of the group within, the, within whose competence it falls. On other occasions, a piece of equipment designed and constructed for the purpose of normal research fails to perform in the anticipated manner, revealing an anomaly that cannot, despite repeated effort, be aligned with professional expectation in these and other ways beside normal science repeatedly goes astray. And when it does... When that is, the profession can no longer evade anomalies that subvert the existing tradition of scientific practice. Then begin the extraordinary investigations that lead the profession at last to a new set of commitments, a new basis for the practice of science. This is Kuhn's first description, I think, in the book of a structure of scientific revolutions and his first distinction between normal science, normal science and science at times of crisis, science in revolutionary times. So normal science is what happens when Scientists assume that they have a pretty good idea what the world is like, and on that assumption, they study the world, solve a few puzzles, you know. If, if this theory of evolution or this theory of, um, of um, Einsteinian relativity or this theory about quantum physics, um, if we have any about <laughs> quantum physics, uh, we can use that for it. There's so much debate and confusion in quantum physics. Um, maybe I should look for a different example, but uh, if this theory about evolution or something in physics or something in astronomy, if this theory is correct, then why this? Why do we have this one thing that seems a little weird? There must be some explanation. Theory is correct. We've learned it from experience. We've learned it by good experiments. Theory must be correct. Let's solve this puzzle. That's how normal science works. You assume that you know what the world is like and you try to fill in some of the details that haven't been filled in yet. But sometimes some of the puzzles cannot be solved. Sometimes the details cannot be explained by the theory we accept when we assume we know what the world is like. And then when the profession can no longer evade anomalies, then begin the extraordinary investigations that lead the profession at last to a new set of commitments, a new basis for the practice of science, a new set of assumptions about what the world is like. And, um, and a rejection of the former assumption. A paradigm shift. Next sentence. The extraordinary episodes in which that shift of professional commitments occurs are the ones known in this essay as scientific revolutions. They are the tradition-shattering complements to the tradition-bound activity of normal science. So there's science in normal times. We think we know how the world works. And we're interpreting according to certain theories. And then there's science in revolutionary times when you can no longer solve the puzzles with the old paradigms in place, the old dominant theories that we're using to interpret the data. And so the new, uh, it becomes necessary for new paradigms, new ways of interpreting the data to emerge. And that is a paradigm shift. And that is a scientific revolution. And that's uh, science that times other than ordinary science at revolutionary times. So uh, we will continue in subsequent chapters in subsequent videos. See you then. Thanks for watching.